Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to see you again. I am Anna Pomazanova, Rossmore Excursion Desk Coordinator. Welcome to a Around the World Travel Presentation. Today, I have a guest, Steve Shields. Hi, Steve. Hi, Anna. I know that a couple of years ago, you went on an amazing adventure. It was a cruise from Santiago, Chile, to Buenos Aires, Argentina, all around South America. Yes, around Cape Horn. Wonderful. And today, Steve is going to tell us about this amazing cruise and show us some pictures. Yes, I'm ready. In February of 2018, I took a trip to South America with three close friends and about 15 other people I work with at the San Francisco Cruise Pier and some friends of theirs. We went mainly to sail on the Emerald Princess from Santiago, Chile to Buenos Aires, Argentina, but we extended the trip at both ends. My friends were Elaine Berg, a travel agent from Pleasanton, Susan Levine, Elaine's sister from Alameda, and Roy Palmieri, another travel agent from Cambridge, Massachusetts. We flew on Avion Airlines, the National Airlines of Columbia, three of us from Los Angeles and Roy from Boston. We flew business class, which as you can see is quite luxurious. And since all Avianca flights stop in Bogota and none of us had ever been there, we decided to overnight. We arrived early in the morning, dropped our bags at the airport hotel and were picked up by a guide that I had hired. One of the first stops she took us to was the funicular to a 10,000 foot high viewpoint and church overlooking the city. Here's the church, which is called Montserrat. And here is the view of the city. Oh, wow, spectacular. Yes, it's huge, who would think that? I had a hard time breathing at the altitude. It's about a thousand feet higher up at the church than where this picture was taken than down in the city. Back down in the city, we saw signs of America. <laughs> Subway. <laughs> and many buildings painted with wonderful and fanciful murals. This is just one of them, but there was a line of them up and down the block. One of the many buildings that you visit is the Gold Museum. Quite large, this is just one picture of it. We, we stopped and had lunch, and I couldn't help but be impressed with the really gigantic avocados that they have in Colombia. One of the best and totally free things to do is the Botero Museum. I know you'll recognize his paintings and sculptures immediately. He was a Colombian. He gave this museum. Here's one of his most famous pictures. That's the artist himself over on the left. You see his sculptures everywhere. I saw one in Minnesota a year ago. And that's a self-portrait, but not the person in the front. <laughs> <laughs> this is also at the museum. And our, here are Susan, Elaine, Roy, and me. And that black hand is now we've had a good night's sleep and a six-hour flight to Santiago, the capital of Chile. We arrived on a Sunday and not very much was open, but here's a typical downtown plaza, very uh, colonial looking, always a church on the square. Here's some fruit in the market. and the old market, which dates from 1872 and has now been converted into a food hall with many restaurants. I had shrimp for lunch. Looks delicious, yum yum. And a salad, nothing really unfamiliar in South American food. Here's an appetizer plate there on the left. Next to our small and lovely hotel on a tree-lined street was an ice cream parlor, which we were told had the best ice cream in Chile. Here are four guys from our party, three of them from San Francisco, 
and one of them from Chicago. But every time we went to the restaurant, it was closed. So I never got to try the ice cream and I'll have to go back to Chile. Absolutely. You now have to go back. <laughs> you don't need much excuse really to travel. <laughs> Took some private tours through a large internet site and our first one was about 40 people. We went to Valparaiso, the port for Santiago. It was about a two hour ride through fields, many of them grapes, as Chile is famous for its wine. Our first stop was the Pablo Neruda Museum. And on the right, you see a sign in town at a, at a little store for a Coke, Coca-Cola ad. And one of my favorite pictures, and one you'd be hard to duplicate in America, a teenager reading a book instead of reading his phone. In fact, this was unusual behavior in South America too. There were dozens of colorful murals painted on the walls. Here are two of them. But they were all over and really kind of fun, I thought. Beautiful, yeah. You get to Lower Valparaiso by a cable car that costs about 10 cents and takes you to a market plaza. Here's a view on the way down of a, oh, you might find something like that in San Francisco, I would think, a very narrow street. Narrow streets, right? And if you have people in your party who collect Starbucks mugs, and many people on my trips do, here was a chance to do so. We were taken to a lunchroom with a view over the harbor, and we had wonderful fish stew. Nice view there of, you can see the harbor there where the ships used to leave. Now they leave a little farther south in another town. And then we went to Val, uh, we went to Viña del Mar, which is the Beverly Hills of Santiago. Oh, here's a picture. I'm sorry, I forgot of the money we paid. It was thousands of pesos, but certainly not a lot of money in dollars. So here's Viña del Mar. Oh, Pretty beautiful clock with flowers. Um, and one of the things in um, Viña del Mar is a museum uh, for Rapa Nui. Rapa Nui is the uh, Polynesian name for Easter Island. And although it is six hours away by air, it's part of Chile and one of the most remote places on earth. I haven't been there, but at least I've seen one of these mysterious sculptures, which are called moas outside the museum. But of course there are hundreds or maybe thousands of them in Easter Island. How large are they, Steve? Are they pretty big? Oh yeah, that's probably 15 or 20 feet high there. I should have put a person in the picture to show you. They're very large. Nobody knows uh, how they got them from one place to another. Someday I'll go there, but it's lower on the list. <laughs> So one of the great blessings for senior citizens about this cruise is that just about every other day was a port and alternate days were at sea like this picture here, making it very relaxing after a hard day of walking along on shore or hiking or, or sightseeing, you could come back and have a whole day of doing nothing much at all. There were around 3,000 passengers and they were mostly Americans, British, Canadians, Argentines, and Chileans. As South Americans, even those with very young children, eat dinner around 11 p.m., we barely saw them. A wonderful Spanish court lecturer gave two presentations a day, one in English and one in Spanish. And he had a great sense of humor. He's one of the best court lecturers I've ever heard. Our first port of call was Puerto Montt. And of course, what would a trip to South America be without seeing a llama, alpaca, or guanaco? We saw all three. Isn't this a beautiful llama? And there's another one in the back. Yeah. Here again, we took a private tour for mainly 30, about 30 people. The countryside is beautiful, and we were told you could buy a new house with a car for about what a garage would cost in California. We were taken to a river with this beautiful waterfall, really unspoiled spot. Isn't that lovely? 
Yeah, beautiful. And here is uh, Elaine and me with the water in the background and the entrance then to a lakeside park and a pier that goes into the lake. Nice, beautiful. We were taken to a large tourist restaurant with a huge buffet. I wonder if we'll ever get to eat buffets again in our life. I have no idea. But in this part of the uh, South America, actually everywhere in South America, pretty much everybody eats steak and it was very good and all the food was very fresh. We had a waiter who laughs a lot and really seemed to enjoy his job. The town we were in was called Rosales. And I don't know whether it's named after the hundreds of roses growing here or whether they planted the roses after the city was named. But it was here in Patagonia that I saw my first of the Northern California-based Patagonia stores. And here's a view of the ship docked off the pier. So you can kind of see this place didn't have a, a pier and we used a, I mean, it had a pier, but not that a ship could dock at. So you can see the little tender there on the side of the ship. That's how you got to and from the ship. Again, underway, you can see that the weather began to deteriorate. We were lucky, you know, the weather, of course, in South America is reversed, and this is summertime, but as you go south, it still got cold and dreary. We were lucky we never had a rainy day ashore, but we had a lot of them at sea, and the ship was not equipped with a covered pool, as many of them are. What we did have is this elite lounge where every day at five, they had a small buffet for their best customers. In fact, no one ever checked to see if you belong, so feel free to use it anyway. These are my friends from the cruise pier in San Francisco. One piece of good advice some Rossmore friends who had taken this cruise before had given me was that if you're going from Chile to Argentina, get a room on the port side of the ship, and if you're going in the other direction, on the starboard side. This is the reason. There's wonderful views of these glaciers that you get from your balcony, or if you don't have a balcony, from your window. So here's some more, uh, more, here's a beautiful view of the ship. And then we arrive in the next port, which is Punta Arenas. Susan Spanish was quite good, and she got us a taxi to take us to this private museum of ship rep replicas, which includes the Magellan ship and the Darwin ship. Here's a map of Magellan's voyage by this spot. You can tour the ships. Go on board and look at how people managed to get all over the world on what we would consider pretty small ships these days. And of course the straits there are named after Magellan. Here is Susan and Elaine at the Strait of Magellan. South of there is nothing until you get to Antarctica. Antarctica, right? Yep. And here in the town, I was amused to see a t-shirt. Yeah. Hawaii. Hawaii. That's fun. <laughs> South Americans and very exotic. So we spend another day passing by more glaciers and you can see the weather got worse as we went south. Here's a beautiful waterfall on the left there and another huge glacier on the right. And now we reach Ushuaia, which is in Argentina, not in Chile. And here's a sign that says, live at the end of the world. The main reason people visit this small town is to catch a ship to Antarctica, which is only 1,000 miles to the south. There really isn't much else to do here. But there is a sign on the pier reminding visitors that the Argentines view the British-held Falkland Islands as part of Argentina. 
along, they call it the Malvinas, you can see up there, and the South Georgia Islands and the South Sandwich Islands, all of which the rest of the world recognizes being part of Great Britain, but not the Argentine. So are they still trying to dispute that that's their territory or no? They're definitely disputing it, but they aren't doing anything uh, militarily, I don't okay, think. Okay, oh, good. So it's a peaceful protest. So this is the protest right there. Yeah. Somebody cut up. But first we circle back to the end of the world, the real end of the world, which is in Chile again. This is Cape Horn. So when people say they're going around the horn, this is it. And it contains a small naval outpost and not much else. We were told that people can have children, the sailors and um, their wives and children up to the age of 10. After that, they have to go back to the mainland so the children can go to school at older children's school. Or whether your ship will either circle this island or go by one side and then turn around and come back. Of course, it isn't really the end of the world, but they call it the end of the world, and it is the end of South America. Now we get to the main reason to take this cruise, a 600-mile detour to the Falkland Islands. And I should say that although this is the highlight of the cruise, only 50% of the ships that go to the Falkland Islands are able to get in because the weather is terrible and there is no pier. So if the, I just really prayed the night before that we'd have good weather and we had absolutely fabulous weather. Yeah, wow, wow, lucky you. Oh, we really were. The Argentines call this Las Malvinas. And because many Argentines were on our cruise, Princess split the difference and didn't call it either one. They called it Fort Stanley. And they advised us that if we bought T-shirts that said Falkland Islands, we should not wear them in the Argentine port. You may recall that Argentine, Argentines attacked this lightly fortified island and overwhelmed the few sailors only to have Maggie Thatcher strike back and throw them out. But that's not why we came. We came to see Volunteer Point. To do that, you get in privately owned Land Rovers and Jeeps, four to a car, and the local driver is also your guide. You have to book this very expensive excursion early, as only about six peop 60 people can visit it. And it takes about three hours over an ever diminishing road. Here's what that road looks like. And you can see why you need a Land Rover. And it got worse after that. But here's why you came. Of course, you aren't supposed to do this, but this Argentine woman just loved penguins, and there are four different kinds here. You're not supposed to, uh, to um, go up to the animals, but if the animals come up to you, that's considered okay. And they do. They're kind of curious about us. Now, here's some small penguins. And here is the most spectacular reason for coming this far. Oh, wow. So much money. Isn't this just fantastic? Beautiful. What are they called? Emperor penguins? Emperor penguins. The little bulge you see at the bottom of each penguin is because they're sitting on an egg. They lay one egg, and the males and females, which look alike, unlike many birds, um, they take turns incubating that egg. Mm -hmm. They're waddling off. You can sometimes see the eggs, and sometimes you see the shells from the ones that have hatched. Let's look at more penguins. I think you can see on the left, you can see a chick under the um, penguin in the middle, and there's a full size chick to the left of that just standing there. Yeah. Very beautiful. Beautiful. So I took this following picture because this is supposedly an English speaking country, but they don't know where to put apostrophes. As a former editor, it annoyed me. <laughs> <laughs> Penguins in this next shot are on the sand, although it looks like snow. They waddle down to the sea and they plunge in to get food for their chicks. 
even though all sorts of predators wait in the water, um, one of the rangers told me that these leopard seals just tear these birds apart. But there's so many thousands of them that the seals don't eat that many compared to the large number. And I don't think they're in any way in danger. There are also gulls that go overhead and, and uh, break the eggs when the penguins are gone. But there, there are thousands of these penguins, and it's very interesting because they sort of segregate themselves. They all mix together in this picture, but when they come out of the land, the Gentoo and the Magellans and the emperors, they all go to their own area. I don't know, I don't know why that is, but they do. You get a couple of hours to watch this and you have a sandwich lunch before heading back to Stanley. There isn't much to see in Stanley, but here's a bust of Margaret Thatcher. He's the liberator of the Falklands, and they love her. Apart from tourism for two months a year, most people raise ship, and they've recently discovered oil, but not on this island. Uh, there's one flight a week to get here if you need to fly in. I met a couple of men from the University of California at Berkeley who are working on something, and uh, there may be two ships. The flights, of course, are from Chile, Argentina does not recognize this island, and so they don't have any flights there. Here's a boy who's piping us off the island. He didn't even want tips. He just seemed to be playing for the joy of it. And isn't this a great name for the weekly newspaper? Everything for sale in the stores. I think this probably sells mostly to tourists because the locals probably all know each other and know the news. But, uh, Everything for sale in the stores was imported from England and marked up three times. But even though there's a lot of uh, English people living there, certainly everyone is not English. Many Europeans, many people come for jobs. The pay is pretty high. It's, uh, it's a very international place, and, and I'm really glad I got there. Back on board the ship for the cruise back to the mainland, we played trivia almost every day between 10 and 4. This wasn't my team, but sometimes they won, and the prizes were trivial too. But when my team won, we got these marvelous penguins for our prize. So that was a big win in trivia, more than I've won at Rossmore Trivia, I would say. Of course, Rossmore Trivia is better, isn't it, Anna? Of course, it's the best. <laughs> Much harder. Anyway, uh, it's sunrise now, and we arrive in the next port, which is Puerto Madryn. It was so windy that we were delayed until midnight, but they added the missed time to the next port. Again, we joined a private tour, and we walked down this stairway here. And saw even more penguins. Oh, these are little, little, tiny penguins. They're very They're cute. They, they lived in these little holes that they dug there, so they're a little different. And uh, you can see from this portrait that the weather is getting better as we go north. It got warm. We're back in shorts. It's very cold in, uh, in around Cape Horn. And we even saw an armadillo. I'm sure the people watching this who are from Texas will have seen thousands of armadillos, mostly crushed on the road, I understand. But this is the first and only one I've ever seen. Now we have another day at sea. To relax, yep. And then we pull into Montevideo, the capital of Uruguay, and situated on the Rio Plata. It's a beautiful European looking old city, even though in fact, it's a fairly young country, but it looks old and it looks beautiful and it was beautiful. It almost looks like Canada, like Quebec, almost. Uh, Frontenac, that's true. Of course, maybe the Chateau Frontenac was built on this, who knows? And again, we see a lot of people, oh, uh, this is a, a monument to, uh, to the um, original settlers of Montevideo. 
and we joined a, another private group. Our guide was celebrating his 21st birthday. Well, there's the meat. Sorry, got it out of order there. But there's meat sizzling on a grill. And here's our guide. It was his 21st birthday. His mother is a doctor and his father is a senator. And he was a dual citizen with Argentina. He spoke perfect English. Definitely a member of the upper class, but a very nice young man. We stopped at a market for snacks. Well, here's a nice fountain, show you downtown. And there's a pretty market where we saw Dolce de Leche, which is very popular all over South America. You can get it on ice cream, you can get it in cookies, you can get it all sorts of different ways. And finally, our guy demonstrated how to feed ducks. Buenos Aires is just across the river from Montevideo. And here we saw our first glimpse of it in the early morning. Although it is our final port of call, we overnighted on the ship. For our final tour, we did a nine hour walking tour. To be honest, I thought it was very hard in the extreme heat and high humidity, though of course we didn't walk the entire time. Here's Elaine with a local statue. We stopped to use the restrooms at this very European coffee house, and I thought it looked like we could have been in Vienna. Yeah. The mural on a building. Two painted murals, in fact. And this is in the Boca part of Argentina, which is very brightly painted and very Italian. You can see the, that it is the home of the tango and you can get a liquado or fruit juice and lots of other lovely things to see in this part of town. We stopped for lunch on our own in this covered iron market, all sorts of little restaurants. And what you order is an empanada. Here's a woman at an empanada stand. Oh, wow. It can be filled with anything you want. And one of the most popular tourist sites in Buenos Aires is this above ground cemetery. And the reason everybody comes is to look for the tomb of Evita, thanks to Weber anyway. So you can see that somebody took a red marking pen and circled the tomb in this huge cemetery so that you could make your way over to Evita. I believe her name is actually Duarte. The next night we took taxis from our hotel to the new opera house, which was built in 1852 and not to be confused with the old opera house, which is down the street and which is now a bookstore. We were here for a Leonard Bernstein concert by the Buenos Aires Philharmonic. And we enter this fantastic building and look at this beautiful hall with six levels of boxes. The boxes are beautiful, but they're actually cheaper than sitting in the orchestra. And the very best seats that friends of mine had bought for us were these orchestra seats, which cost about $60. You can see that people dress very casually but these were real music lovers. They paid a lot of attention. They knew when to applaud. They knew when not to applaud. Very polite audience. A wonderful opportunity, I think, to see the local people and see what it was like. Our hotel was in the Palermo district, which is the largest district in Buenos Aires. And it was once a working man's neighborhood, but now it's rapidly gentrifying. Lots of parks and restaurants. Right across from the street, Roy and I had lunch in this sports bar. Since Argentines eat very late, we were the only ones there. And of course, we had steak. Roy is a train buff, so we visited the main train station. It's quite beautiful, even though there are actually very few trains in Argentina. The old waiting room has been converted into a Starbucks, so you can get another one of those cups. And about a mile and a very long, hot walk away was a railroad museum. 
this young English-speaking guide was delighted to see us. As they were about to close the museum forever, he thought. He didn't think it would ever reopen. He even offered us to give us the museum cat. <laughs> of course, maybe he could get a job as a dog walker. This man had his hands full. We bought tickets on a hop-on, hop-off bus. And this is a sculpture at the last stop. It's solar-powered, and it opens and closes with the sun. It's really quite lovely. The whole city is very beautiful. And finally, here we are back at the Bogota airport, waiting for our flights back to Los Angeles and Boston. A very nice ending to a very nice trip. Wow, quite, quite an adventure, Steve. Let's mention that uh, this is only done in the summer in Argentina, which is basically January and February. I don't think, well, I, it didn't operate this year. We're already past January and February. But next year, hopefully it will. And all the cruise lines offer it. Holland America, Princess, uh, uh, Crystal, Celebrity, you name it. Everybody does it all together. You see all the other ships in port. And uh, it's a wonderful adventure. I recommend it to anybody. It's only two weeks if you don't have time to stay longer. So uh, it's a good thing to do. Wonderful. And as far as, uh, you know, going through several climate zones, did you have to pack a lot of, you know, warm clothes? and? We did. Uh, so, uh, and Princess, like many cruise lines, doesn't really have uh, too much in the way of laundry facilities, but they had enough. And, and uh, yeah, it's definitely cold. You can see we're all wearing sweaters here, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's summer. But Bogota, uh, maybe it could have been warmer, but it wasn't. It was never really swimming weather. I don't think I ever saw anybody in the swimming pool the whole trip. In the jacuzzis, maybe. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Pictures and your story about this wonderful cruise. Thank I you. hope it will inspire people to, you know, actually take a chance and maybe sign up for a cruise in the not so distant future. Or they could go to cowboy country, couldn't they? That's right. Thank you so much for mentioning. Yes, um, Excursion Desk uh, is actually offering a couple of new trips um, in starting in the fall, starting in September. Uh, we have Discover Cowboy Country. We're also going to offer a trip to Smoky Mountains. And in December, it's going to be to Santa Fe to see, um, you know, this beautiful, beautiful uh, city. So... I hope you guys in, will, enjoy, will join us some, sometime. They're all marvelous places. I recommend them all. Although, I don't know, Santa Fe could be kind of cold in December. That's right, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> We've got skiing in Taos just up the road. So, But it's beautiful. It's absolutely worth going to. Great food, wonderful people, terrific, terrific, uh, terrific state, New Mexico. And beautiful museums, too. Beautiful museum, absolutely fabulous. There's one with uh, folk uh, folk art in little dioramas. It's uh, I think it's called the I'm gonna say the Wentworth, but I think that might be wrong. But it's a really great museum. So and of, and of course George O'Keefe has a museum now. I was there a year ago, and I love that. And so yeah, there's so much to do there, and the food is fabulous. So I hope you'll be leading that tour, Anna. I would love to. We'll see what happens. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for being with us today. I will see you next Wednesday for another Around the World Travel presentation. For now, please stay safe and healthy. Goodbye. Bye.